there, everyone. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Besser. I'm the Director of Public Programs here. I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's Hammer Forum on the resurgence of social justice issues in the Catholic Church with Sister Simone Campbell and moderated by Ian Masters. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please silence your cell phones and let you know that photography and video recording are not permitted in the theater. Um, I also want to quickly mention some Hammer exhibitions and upcoming programs you might be interested in. We just opened the Hammer's second annual biennial called Made in LA, which features works by 35 Los Angeles-based artists with an emphasis on emerging and under-recognized artists. We're going to be discussing the ongoing situation in the Ukraine at the next Hammer Forum on July 2nd with Nina Khrushcheva. She's the, grand, great, no, she's the granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader who gave Crimea to the Ukraine in 1954. Um, also with her is going to be USC professor um, Robert English, who specializes in Russia, the former USSR, and Eastern Europe. For our August Hammer Forum, we are commemorating the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I with a look at the breakdown of diplomacy that preceded the war to end all wars and how we might apply those lessons to today's challenges. And one of our guest speakers is former U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Chess Freeman. Also on August 6th, Medea Benjamin, activist and co-founder of Code Pink, will be speaking here in, dia in dialogue with filmmaker and activist Haskell Wexler. And all summer long, we have scores of programs and works of art that look at gender issues, social justice issues, and issues of sexuality and identity. And then if you need a restorative break from all of that, we offer free weekly mindful awareness meditation sessions. Um, we also have concerts and World Cup soccer matches and free film screenings all summer long. So. The hammer is free. I hope you're going to take advantage of our free admission to visit us often and mine our multifaceted offerings. Yay, free! Um, if you want to receive reminder emails about upcoming programs and events, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the lobby of the theater that you can get onto our email list. Um, you can also find out more on our website. You can also subscribe to video podcasts of most of our public programs, including the Hammer Forum, uh, on our website or through iTunes. So on to tonight's program. The Hammer Forum is a series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with the very generous support of Andy and Barney Galev. Thank you. In tonight's forum, we'll discuss the arrival of Pope Francis and the resurgence of social justice issues in the Catholic Church, as well as the inclusion of social justice issues such as income inequality in the next election. When we get to our Q&A portion of the evening, please respect our house rules, including keeping your questions to the topic at hand, and please make your questions brief and straightforward and directed to our guest speaker. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Ian Masters, who's going to introduce Sister Simone. Ian is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who has covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of The Daily Briefing every Monday through Thursday at 5, as well as Background Briefing on Sundays at 11 a.m., all of that on KPFK 90.7 FM. Ian has been a senior fellow at UCLA Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations and was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia and all of you for coming tonight to hear from a political and social activist who does not separate church and state, but rather tries to reform both. Lately, Sister Simone has had some unexpected help with the church from an Argentine Pope who has shattered the rigid doctrinal obsessions and corporal preoccupations of the Vatican over the past few decades ushering in a refreshing honesty and humanity rooted in humility and compassion as the new Bishop of Rome aspires to follow the example of his namesake, St. Francis. Gone are the trappings, the servants, the lavish quarters, the pomp and protocols, to the extent that many of the high living and aggressively conservative American bishops are now talking of needing a tune-up a sacramental oil change, <laughs> draining the sump of scolding and searching for sin, then topping up on simplicity 
and service. Whether the cardinals who elected Pope Francis have biased remorse, <laughs> we shall see. But there is a new spiritual sheriff in town, and while he may not be fixing the canonical law, he is not sitting in judgment, and instead of feasting at the table of the wealthy, he is washing the feet of the poor. Meanwhile, in the temporal world of state, we have an election coming up in November to replace or re-elect a Congress that has an approval rating of about 8%. Now, I challenge anyone in the audience who can tell me they know anybody who is in that 8%. Anyone who actually approves of how our political leaders are handling the nation's business. Okay. On the right, we have the Republicans who appear to be imploding at the moment as the old guard of rhinos reel from an insurgency from the far-right Tea Partiers, while the party's religious right fulminates at the heresy of an ideological insurrection from the libertarian win wing who want to legalize pot, don't want any more wars, and don't care what goes on in the bedroom. Have they no shame? On the left, we have the Democrats who seem afraid to fight back in the face of a blizzard of fact-free fabrications from Fox News, whose abusive bullying and manufactured scandals have them scurrying to the right, away from the absurd charges that they are socialists, so much so that the Dems don't seem to know who they are and what they stand for. For example, the Democrats recently acceded to the 10th inquiry into the bogus Benghazi search for scandal whipped up by Fox News, without even considering conditioning their joining in the Republic in witch-burning farce by insisting there be just one congressional inquiry into the Iraq war. Just do the math. Four Americans killed in Benghazi, 4,489 Americans killed in Iraq, 32,021 wounded, not counting psychological wounds, two to three trillion dollars wasted, and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis killed. What is wrong with them? And now that Iraq has blown up again in our faces, the Republicans are blaming Obama. And what are the Democrats saying? Okay. <laughs> Little wonder our citizens don't vote. And that, of course, will be the deciding factor in the upcoming election. Not who votes, but who does not vote. And as it stands now, in spite of a civil war within their party, Republicans will show up and hold the House and probably win the Senate, while the Democrats will not show up and likely lose both. So here I am depressing you ahead of Sister Simone Campbell, who will inspire you. But to borrow from the subtitle of her new book, A Nun on the Bus, the subtitle which is How All of Us Can Create Hope, Change and Community. That is the heart of the matter. Just because Washington is broken and the billionaires own the Republicans and rent the Democrats, that's not an excuse to check out and dismiss the political world as a train wreck you're walking away from. We get the government we deserve, and as long as we play their game and not step up to the plate and start playing our game, we will all be losers. So with no more talk of what terrible things are happening to us and in the spirit of how all of us can create hope, change, and community, <laughs> let's change the subject so we can do what to what we can do to make things happen and make a better world for ourselves and our children. Sister Simone Campbell will speak for 15 minutes and then we'll have a conversation followed by extensive Q&A with you, our audience. Sister Simone Campbell is the Executive Director of Network, a Catholic social justice lobby. She was singled out for criticism by the previous Pope for what the Vatican believed to be the promoting of radical feminist themes incompatible with the Catholic faith specifically Network's ties to the Leadership Conference of Women Religious and its support for President Obama's health care reform push, as well as, as its failure to promote church teachings on abortion, contraception, homosexuality, and the male-only priesthood. Meanwhile, she managed to save the Affordable Care Act from an early death, organize the Nuns on the Bus tour in the last election, and write her latest book, now out in bookstores, A Nun on the Bus, How All of Us Can Create Hope, Change, and Community. Ladies and gentlemen, Sister Simone Campbell. Well, 
I didn't see anybody leave the room after Ian did that real upbeat introduction. Um, it is, it's great to be here in Los Angeles. I'm honored to be here at the Hammer Museum. It's my first trip to the museum, so even though I'm a native of Southern California, I, I want to speak tonight a bit about, just to start our conversation, a bit about what Pope Francis is up to, what I think some of our challenges are, but how it applies to the political world in which we live. One of the great gifts of Pope Francis, or I've been calling him Frank, because <laughs> I, I feel quite affectionate towards him, and I don't think he'd mind, you know. So is his keen knowledge of what it means to live in poverty, because he has a pastoral experience of relating to ordinary people. One of the real challenges within the Roman Catholic Church is that over the last 30 years, the, those who have been appointed into, to be bishops, into leadership roles, in the United States, the maximum amount of pastoral experience, I was told, that they brought was five years because they all came from either jobs in the Vatican or academic or canon law, working in chancery offices and doing that level of leadership. They had not walked with people struggling, suffering, making all of those tough choices every day in trying to survive. Pope Francis refreshingly brings the knowledge of real people. And because of that knowledge, then he is able to say in the exhortation that he issued last November, that the need to resolve the structural causes of poverty cannot be delayed, not only for the pragmatic reason of its urgency for the good order of society, but because society needs to be cured of a sickness which is weakening and frustrating it, and which can only lead to new crises. He says that welfare projects which meet certain urgent needs should not be considered merely temporary response, should, excuse me, should be considered merely temporary responses. As long as the problems of the poor are not radically resolved by rejecting the absolute autonomy of markets and financial speculation, and by attacking the structural causes of inequality, no solution will be found for the world's problems, or, for that matter, to any problems. Inequality is the root of social ill. Applause. But applause for a spiritual leader standing up and being clear to the markets. Historically, the Vatican got kind of controlled by U.S. wealth because the Vatican for many years was very dependent on U.S. wealth in order to do its charitable works. And what Pope Francis has done is said, that's not the gospel. That's not where we are. That's not what we care about. If we follow the gospel of Jesus, not the gospel of money, the gospel of Jesus leads us to those who suffer and struggle. And so what I have come to realize even before Pope Francis boldly did this is that the key... I think for all of us in our society is to be willing to touch the pain of our world as real. Now we as people in the U.S. have a tendency to think if you see something broken you got to fix it. And so we're kind of the do-good folks, we're going to take care of it, we're going to fix everything. The fact is we cannot fix it all. And quite frankly faith the faith challenge within the Christian tradition is not about fixing. It's about letting our hearts be broken open so that there's room for more. As long as my heart is closed and I'm just fixing stuff, then I'm in charge. But the fact is these problems are way bigger than any one of us. And to have our hearts broken open then means, one, there's more room for more people in my heart. But it also means that I know I'm not in control. 
I know we need to do this together. And so I wanted to share with you some of my stories about people that have broken my heart because they are the way forward. Some of you have heard me talk about Margaret. This is, this is Margaret's picture. You probably can't see it too well. But I carry these in my Bible. But Margaret died in 2012 because she lost her job in the recession in 2007. She actually lost it at the end of 2007. And when she lost her job, she lost her health care. And when she lost her health care, then she could no longer get screening done for colon cancer, even though she had a genetic predisposition to colon cancer. She ended up dying of colon cancer. Now, her sister brought me this picture when we were on the bus in Cincinnati, and she came directly from the memorial service for Margaret, because she knew Margaret was a troublemaker. Margaret had been a shop steward. Margaret had always made a bit of mischief, and they thought that Margaret would want to be at our gathering. Couldn't imagine why they'd think we were making mischief, but the, the fact was that Margaret's presence at that gathering changed me forever. Because of Margaret's story, I have become a passionate fiend for the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. And we still have 24 states. 24 states have not expanded Medicaid because of politics, not because of what is needed for their people. So if Margaret had been living during the expansion of Medicaid, she would not have died. But now, no more Margarets need to die if politicians do what's right for their people. Now, this is the hard part. It is more about the game of politics than caring for the people. And what Pope Francis is challenging our establishment to do is to break out of the game and look at the needs of real people. That is a huge challenge for all of us. And what he says is that we cannot be attached to safety net programs. Now, I'll tell you, I lobby in Washington, D.C. We spend an inordinate amount of time trying to protect the safety net. And what Pope Francis challenges us to do is to be willing to risk to create structural change that will make a difference for poverty, not just a baseline status quo. We need to change our systems. We need to make sure that this great income and wealth disparity is narrowed, which is going to require tax policy, corporate policy, and accountability. Now, you can imagine those are very popular political <laughs> issues to take on. But we, have, we at Network are working on this. We have this Mind the Gap campaign. We have Mend the Gap. We have four policies we're working on. But the first one we're starting with is why it's wonderful to pay taxes. It invests in our society. And so we did this um, Taxpayer Pride Day on April 15th, where everybody took, it, folks that participated took a selfie of themselves with their favorite government service. Because we the people know that taxes are not a burden. We the people know that taxes are how we invest in creating our society. We the people know that our grandparents paid taxes and created our society that they've given to us. And what are we leaving for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren? It's about we the people taking our appropriate responsibility. So let me just tell you two quick more stories, um, just so that you understand. This is about the 100%, but it's letting our hearts be broken, open. Um, well, I'll just tell you one more, and then we can talk when we have our conversation. Oh, no, no, I got two. One is, sorry. I couldn't, find, I couldn't find my note. Uh, one is about Brittany, uh, who is uh, now she's a sophomore. But I met Brittany at a university outside of Philadelphia. And Brittany uh, came up to me. It's so funny to be popular. I, it's sort of like a rock star. It's pretty silly. But anyway, people get all excited, you know. And this whole gaggle of freshmen came up to me. And they said, oh, they wanted my autograph. It was so sweet. And then Brittany asked if she could talk to me after... Um, I'd given him my autograph and we'd taken pictures. 
And then Brittany told me that she's the first one in her family to go to college. She's an only child, but out of all her extended relatives, no one had ever been to college. That in July, before her, um, uh, the, the dorm opened, her mother had gotten arrested with the mother's boyfriend. And Brittany didn't have enough money to pay rent. She ended up getting evicted. And then she told me that for three weeks before school started, she was homeless. And she said, oh, I, I didn't have to sleep out often. I, just a couple of times. I had friends. I had friends. And she's told me all this very stoically. And then I said, well, how are you doing? And she said, well, the, uh, she had just gotten a paperback, her first paperback in college, and she only got a B plus. And she burst into tears at that with a B plus. And I threw my arms around her and just held her. And she said, I'm so afraid I can't do this. I'm so afraid I won't be good enough. This is my dream to make this happen. And so I was so touched by her that I asked her to give me her autograph so that I could carry her with me and know that people are struggling and making a difference, but it is so hard. And then she, she signed it, and then she said, can I put my mom's name down too? And so I carry Brittany and Tony with me. But it's not just about Brittany and Tony or Margaret's of our world. It's also about Jason, who I met down in uh, La Jolla, who's an entrepreneur. He's 35 years old. He's created three different companies. He's mega rich. And I'm trying to get him to support Network, quite frankly, my organization. But what he told me was he pays a living wage. He pays good wages to his people, but he's getting upset. Because he realized his tax dollars are going to fund his competitors. Because his competitors don't pay a living wage. And they have their low-skilled workers go use the safety net. And because of that, Jason realized his taxes are supporting his competitors' low-wage workers. And his competitors can charge lower fees for their services. And he's at a competitive disadvantage. I had never thought of business that way. This current structural imbalance that we have is undermining the 100%. It's undermining all of us because it is constricting creativity. It's constricting business. And you know what? It's not the best of who we are. The best of who we are is what Pope Francis talks about. We're problem solvers. We need to create this more perfect union. Now, I do it because of faith. I do it because Jesus is all about justice. I do it because, for me, my mission in life is to take faith into the world and even onto Capitol Hill. It's really fun. It's a great experience. High adventure. And yet, I know not everybody does this because of faith. Where we meet in a pluralistic society is the Constitution. And it's all about we the people. It is an unpatriotic lie that we're based in individualism. It is we the people who are forming this more perfect union. And we the people, we need to stand up. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> as one of the people. <laughs> we're um, sitting down, though. <laughs> The, the role of religion, though, in, in terms of social change and political change, if you, if you just sketch back in history, has been profound. Uh, ending slavery, ending child labor, um, creating human rights, civil rights, women's rights. So how do we... We did a, we did a forum a, a few months ago on where is the religious left? And you're the religious left, right? <laughs> so we found the religious left, finally. <laughs> or at least one member of it. Yeah. So let's start with that. Is there a possibility of a revival of faith in politics, and, and, and in particularly in politics that are going to raise up with the people rather than the kind of divisive use of, of religion? Um, because I think... Maybe I'm too polemical, but I, I think that most of the televangelists are simply a front for right-wing politics. I don't see much of the gospel in, 
You know, Jesus didn't carry an AK-47. He didn't hate homosexuals. He didn't shake down poor people for money. I, I just don't get, I don't see that as being religion. So what's your sense, uh, since you've, you, you seem more, more of an optimist than I am? <laughs> oh, the good days. I, I always have to balance people out. So if you got too optimistic, I'd probably have to be pessimistic. But um, I, I really do think that there is uh, a hunger in our society for hope and for this being seen. I, I, I'll never forget being on the bus last year and we were in a real rural place and they didn't expect a, 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 this guy who was like in his 60s burst into tears. And, and it always gets me when men cry, I don't expect it. I cry a lot, but I didn't expect that. And he said he was so grateful that we had come that he never thought that they would be seen. And this is one of the real problems, and this is where I think faith is so important because it's within the faith community that we can see each other, that we can nourish each other, that we can be in relationship with each other and know we don't have to be alone, that we don't have to do this all by ourselves. And that individualism is dividing us terribly, and faith is all faiths are about the community, about pulling together. And it's at the heart of that that I think is the hope for our future, because I don't know any other um, institution that encourages community in the same way. It, 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 it isn't part of the civil society right now, but faith can call us back to it, I think, can nourish it. And one of the few improvements, and indeed it'll probably be Obama's legacy in, in terms of us frayed social safety net. We aren't a social democracy like the Europeans are. We don't have many government services, and the ones that we do have, like Social Security and Medicare, are under attack. But am I correct in saying that, that you saved the Affordable Care Act from an early death? <laughs> that yes. with, with, by influencing <laughs> Bart Stupak's vote? Uh, okay. Um, I, actually, what I did was I wrote the nun's letter. And it was signed by 59 Catholic sisters who were leaders of religious congregations. And we released that letter. Okay, the Catholic Health Association came out in favor of the Affordable Care Act. Our beloved bishops were given a bad line, bad advice, and came out opposing the Affordable Care Act. They were actually told that there was federal funding for abortion in the Affordable Care Act, and there's not. But that was a whole other political thing. And then we came out with our nuns letter that on... The bishops came out on Monday, we came out on Wednesday, <laughs> St. Patrick's Day actually, of 2010, um, in favor of the Affordable Care Act, and we got 29 votes. Bart Stupak's effort, wor he worked so hard to try to bring the bishops along, and which is one of the reasons why, I don't know, this is, you can tell I'm a, a Washington, D.C. person, I talk all this detail, wonkish stuff, but Bart Stupak got a executive order where President Obama said, that he really, really, really would follow the law and not do any federal funding of abortion. That had satisfied the bishops when President Bush had done it uh, for stem cell research. That had been sufficient for the bishops on that. But it wasn't sufficient for the bishop's staff when it came to President Obama. And what Bart Stupak told me was the staff told him, oh, they just didn't trust the president to follow the law. And that is the source of the rub, one of the big sources of the rub between um, the Vatican and the nuns. Uh, so, anyway, yeah, so yes, I did help get the Affordable Care Act, and I'm terribly proud of it. I couldn't be more pleased. So, you, you mentioned how 26 states are, are, are opposing expansion of Medicaid. 24. 24. Not, no skin off their nose. Not their money. It's the government's. They're turning away government money. Federal money. Right. Yeah. So it doesn't make any sense. But in, in working uh, to get on, on the nuns on the bus and trying to, to promote the Affordable Care Act, what is your explanation for the... For, for working Americans who passionately oppose it. I mean, this is something that can help people. Already it's helping, you know, we have this indentured generation of students. Student debt is now higher than the household debt. 
Uh, they'd be able to live at home uh, until they're 26 and be covered. There's a, there are already things in it that so, so to, I think to a reasonable mind would indicate that this is a good thing. Right, right. But yet people so feel, are so passionately opposed to it. You know, maybe I'm going back to that book about what's the matter with Kansas. I don't know, but <laughs> I'd like to get your wisdom on, on well, that. Well, what's interesting is all of the polling on the specific issues indicate people favor it. People favor uh, student or uh, kids being able to stay on their parents' insurance till they're 26. People favor no pre-existing conditions. People favor no lifetime cap. People favor health care as a right. People favor uh, shifting from or, or diagnostic care should be, or uh, preventive care should be free and available. People favor shifting from fee for service to a, another formula that that promotes quality. People favor all of those elements. But when you call it Obamacare, then people are against it. And so I can only think that it's political or it's racist. So it's, it's the combination of um, fear and politics that have really undermined this. And um, some uh, right-wing um, programs have created this drumbeat that keeps going. But what's happening now, as people get into it, that it's, it's being fully implemented, they're liking it. And so the poor Republicans have lost the Affordable Care Act as a key issue, because what's happening now is that the favorability is trending up significantly, so that they realize by November, we're going to be almost a year into it, it's not going to be an election issue. They're not going to be able to use it. That's part of the reason why Benghazi is there a new hot topic, or it'll be Iraq, or it will be something else. But uh, the Affordable Care Act was not planned well for him. A great story is Scott Brown, do you know Scott Brown, who was the uh, senator who, uh, Massachusetts, who caused this whole thing to happen. But anyway, but he's trying to run up in New Hampshire now, and he was going around to visit state legislators. And so Scott Brown is in one uh, house of a state legislator. They have sort of a gathering of neighborhood folks and he's going on and on about how horrible the Affordable Care Act is. Terrible, terrible, terrible. He would never have voted for it. Blah, 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 blah. And the, the wife of the state legislator says, speaks up from the kitchen apparently and said, uh, it's the best thing that ever happened to our family. <laughs> and apparently he had nothing to say. He was just like silent. So he's having to retool his whole sound bites because people are finding it's beneficial. So I'm hopeful. So when when you uh, took the the nuns on the bus bus to <laughs> Janesville, Wisconsin, <laughs> right? Tell yes. us about that. Could I, did you ever get an audience with, uh, an with audience. Congressman Paul Ryan? Actually, I did. Uh, I've um, I got a meeting with him. They actually reached out to us when we were on that first bus trip. Okay, Janesville is where Paul Ryan's based. We got there. I thought we were going to have all these pro-Ryan supporters. We had like 300, 350 people supporting us. It was like, whoa. The police gave us an emergency permit to have a rally in the, the town square. Uh, it, it, was, it was awesome. People were singing these, you know, songs and were thanking us. It was so huge. It was only the second day of our trip. I had no idea what lightning had struck. It was so powerful. And of course, we're dragging all this media with us. And so I did a stand-up on CNN, a live stand-up on CNN outside Ryan's office and all this. So on the bus, they did reach out to us after about a week trying to say that, that the congressman would meet with me. But I didn't trust him, so I never referred to it. So in July, I did meet with him. And then just a couple weeks ago, I met with him again to try to um, do some missionary work around uh, helping him understand the struggles of real people. Because he's been doing these hearings on poverty, and I wanted to know what he'd heard, what he'd learned. And <laughs> the short answer is not much. But, um, but he has been trying to... Uh, take Pope Francis somewhat seriously. The one concession I did get from him uh, this last meeting was that he said, well, you know, Pope Francis comes from Argentina where they have crony capitalism. And I say, <laughs> quite like what we have here, right? And, and he said, oh, yes, yes, yes. So I feel that, I thought that was a, a good thing. But, uh, 
So he, um, and then I got to testify in front of him um, last July at one of the hearings on poverty. And uh, the fun thing is, I, I have an odd sense of fun. But um, I, I was the one Democratic witness, and there were three Republican witnesses. And usually what happens is the Democrats ask the Democratic witness, and then the Republicans ask the Republican witnesses. That's usually how it goes. But because I was a Catholic sister, and there's a bunch of Catholic Republicans, they'd always wanted to ask a nun a question. <laughs> and so I ended up having this great opportunity to talk about my people, to share my stories, to introduce them to a heartbreak and what what the reality is, not what their theory or projection is of laziness and needing to incentivize work. Good God, why don't you pay wages, pay real wages? So anyway, I had a great time. So, it, and the other thing is Congressman Ryan did note that I had grown my hair a little longer. So I think that is a sign that he keeps an eye on me, just the way I keep an eye on him. So did he ever reconcile uh, the the Bible uh, or the prophet Jesus with Ayn Rand or Ayn Rand? Oh, did, did that ever come up? No, no. Yeah. Um, when, because I haven't recently read Ayn Rand, I can't bear to do it. So I, I'm not <laughs> I'm not up on it to have a little dispute. But what Pope Francis says, which I think is so important, is that he's if you want to build peace. He's got these four points, but one of them is, the, my favorite is that reality is more important than ideas. And he's, uh, Paul, um, he, he, he lives in his head. And he has all these theories, but no experience. And you can argue a, a theory forever because you believe it. It's your frame. But when you meet Margaret or you meet... Brittany, or you meet all these other people, then you gotta deal with reality, and you can't dismiss it as easily. So um, I, I feel like I could be, I can be more successful telling him real stories, and then seeing how does he factor that in to his concern, to his awareness, and that's how I push him. Right. Keep looking for a heart to break. <laughs> well, but you did you did mention that he mentioned chronic kind of capitalism, and that triggers this just race that just happened in Virginia where, where um, uh, yep. Eric Cantor, the majority leader, lost his seat to this insurgent Tea Party guy. He ran on an anti-Wall Street, anti, right. because Cantor's wife is an executive at Goldman Sachs, um, against the Stock Act, which was the insider trading of Congress people, which Cantor watered down. He ran on a platform of Christian capitalism. I'm not sure what he meant by that. but. <laughs> But what it is clear is that there is a confluence. For example, uh, left-wing environmentalists and right-wing national security hawks have a lot in common. They don't want to be dependent on foreign oil and want to have green energy. This guy is, is anti-Wall Street. And, and, and by the way, he ran on against uh, immigration, not because he was so much against immigration, but because he believed that Cantor uh, was working for corporate America who just wanted to import cheap labor. He, did, he actually didn't run against immigration. He said that Cantor was was doing the corporate side. Exactly. And To get cheap labor. I, I'm, important, still, yeah. I, I'm still so trying I'm, to get immigration yeah. out, so I'm not... Well, I'm, but my question, but you, you can go off on your own tangent if you like, but uh, is about the things that the left and the right have in common, and is there any 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 way that we, we can work on that? Who's working on it? Because it seems to me that politics in this country are being used to divide us and distract us. Oh, I totally agree with that, and that's in order to uh, protect the existing power structures. And um, there are, I, I mean, it, it's interesting that Rand Paul uh, you can work with him on military issues if you're not, uh, I, I mean, like we have a uh, no invasion policy at, at um, network and, and we can work with his office on those issues. So, and he's probably as far right that he comes around on the back side of some stuff that we can meet on. Uh, some of the, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what else, on. Some of the Tea Party things we can, uh, in terms of some of the budget issues, they're good on because they believe we should pay for things. And 
they're not good on taxes, but they are good on government uh, surveillance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or controlling controlling where the federal government intervenes or uh, supervision or like uh, TSA and those kinds of things. They're not for that. So yeah. you can use some of that arguments. I think though that the real thing is is it's still too much politics and it's up to us um, to stand up and say we need governance. We need governance because one of the hard parts with the Tea Party is the Tea Party believes that government shouldn't exist. They, re they don't realize that democracy by definition means deciding problems through government and they don't see that. And so that hamstrings, I, I don't understand running for an office where you think it shouldn't do anything, yes. but that's, that's what they're doing. Yeah. And so to get them to move, then it, it's, we have not, I have not figured out the clue to get them yeah. to move. Sometimes, occasionally on budget issues, you can get them to move, but... Um, but if they call themselves Tea Party patriots, the point you're making is it's unpatriotic to be individualistic. Exactly. And to be and, and that's your ideology as opposed to we the people. Right, right. So again, it gets to my point about when are we going to step up to the plate and start fighting back or at least start shouting out? You know? Well, certainly shouting out. And what I'm advocating are things like grocery store missionary work where uh, there's very few places where we gather as a society with folks who think a variety of thoughts. Um, and so I'm advocating that when the only place I stand in line is at the grocery store. So with a diverse group of people. And so I'll say to somebody standing in front of me or standing behind me, hey, you thought about immigration reform? What are you thinking? <laughs> or um, have you... Do you worry about what's happening with income and wealth disparity and all this big gap we've got? What do you think? And what I've discovered is people do think about this stuff, but nobody ever asks them. We never talk about that stuff. In D.C., you're more likely to talk about, the, oh, the Nationals or the Wizards or, you know, I don't know. Here in L.A., you probably have, you know, movies or something like that. I don't know what you're talking about. But, but the, the challenge is, is that we've got to have serious conversations with each other, with with different points of view being expressed. I, I get taken in sometimes in cars to programs and, and when I'm doing uh, media stuff like an MSNBC and all that. And so I had, in one 10 day period, I was in three cars. The first guy told me, oh, he really followed politics. He loved politics. He liked to know what the truth was. So he listened to Fox News. <laughs> The second guy, we're having a similar conversation. The second guy says, oh, yeah, he wants to know what the truth is. He listens to MSNBC. I thought, well, I do that sometimes. The third guy says practically the same thing. I want to know what the truth is, so I listen to CNN. And then I realize I want to know what the truth is, so I listen to NPR and PBS. So it's like we're all siloed, and there's no place where we have um, a variety of perspectives where you can exchange and so one of the things we the people have to do is talk to each other mm -hmm. thanksgiving share talk to your family everybody has a some relative like my brother jim which is like oh my gosh maybe we ought to swap those difficult relatives but we've got to talk to them <laughs> you take jim and i'll take you <laughs> you mean every day is thanksgiving right? every day is thanksgiving but it's really important because if we don't have serious conversations this foolishness continues because there's no momentum to make change. So what was it you wanted to say about immigration? Because I, I want to get some questions here. Oh, cool. Immigration still has a narrow, narrow, narrow window, but it is possible to get it out. And the, one of the challenges is there is an analysis of the Cantor race that says, oh, it just was about immigration and it's dead. The fact is, it was not that much about immigration. It was about, it was running against corporate America. And so what we're saying is, is that now that frees up the principle of comprehensive reform because that is what we need. That's what the economy needs. That's what the nation needs. That's what um, kids need. I mean, all the kids that we met who are these DACA kids, the dreamers that got deferral of deportation, 
Do you know how guilty they feel that they can't protect their parents? Do you know the kind of fear they have that their parents are going to be deported? It's, it's terrifying. We were lobbying in Phoenix with a young woman, Jackie, and she's 19 years old. She's a DACA kid, so she has deferral of deportation. But you know what her fear is? Her fear is that she's not doing a good enough job raising her 11-year-old twin siblings because both of her parents have been deported. And her, she said, I talk to him, I, she talks to him every weekend to try to get advice. But 11 years old, going into being teenagers, and she's responsible for these kids. She's working part-time and going to uh, community college. And it's because of our stupid policy. Everybody in the U.S. thinks comprehensive, Im well, 70% thinks comprehensive immigration reform makes sense. It's good. There's no, no organized opposition except fear-baiting on the part of a few. And John Boehner holds the key. It is doable between now and the end of August, uh, end of July, if we can, we can just get it out of the house. It's up to John But they're Boehner. all running scared because of what happened to Canada, aren't they? Um, not as frightening as some think. A few are. There, let's see, but here's, here's where, the, here's the strategy. The strategery that's going on <laughs> is that some who want to stop it are trying to gin up the fear and those of us, you could just see us all grappling to, to shift the message around this. So those of us that think it was about corporate America and that there is now this golden opportunity to really do the whole thing, not just the corporate thing. Uh, so that's our messaging, and we're duking it out. So in a nonviolent, very thoughtful, religious way. <laughs> so we have microphones on both sides. Um, and there's somebody there right next to you. Hi. Um, just to talk about the uh, the Dreamers again, uh, my understanding was that the program was going to be very uh, unruly over ten, a 10 year period. It was going to be very difficult to uh, trace everyone and uh, make sure that they jumped through all the hoops. And even after the 10 year period, the students would not in any way be able to get citizenship for their parents or anyone else anyway. So it seems to me that if it had passed, what you just said about it would still be true. No, it's not. You've, you've conflated two pieces. You conflated the DACA, the def, uh, Deferred Action piece for uh, folks, uh, kids who were brought here uh, as children by their parents. You've conflated that with the Senate bill. The Senate bill is the one that has the hoops. The DACA piece has a two-year, every two years it gets renewed. So um, the Senate bill, uh, 744, has um, a complicated provisions that requires 13 years, estimated 13 years. It, it's really complicated, but it is um, way better, way better yes, than what we have now. But in both cases, their parents would not be eligible. No, no, they would. They would. In the the Senate one? bill, the Senate bill gets people to legal status, then to permanent residence, and then to citizenship. That's the Senate bill. Uh, the House is terrified about voting for citizenship. All we have to do is, uh, this is the politics of it, is to get a path to permanent residence without a bar to citizenship. Because once you get people to permanent residence, the existing law kicks in, and five to seven years, then they can become citizens. So they don't have to vote for citizenship. They just have to vote for permanent residence. That's politics. This gentleman up here on the left. Glad you can see. I can't. Oh, that's well. That's, uh, what are your thoughts on liberation theology, and do you mm -hmm. see a resurgence in it? Um, okay, liberation theology is this glorious theology of, of that takes life, and in a life experience of struggle or heartbreak you reflect on the gospel. And I think some of what Pope Francis is talking about uh, is nourishing the roots of that. Uh, one of the challenges is that we in the first world think that we've got the same experience of oppression. And I realized that uh, many years ago, as I was studying liberation theology, that the first world theology, we can't claim it, but the same process the praxis, as they call it, is key for integrating faith and life. And so what I realized as a first world person, 
that what we have to do, I think, is create a theology of insecurity and that it's the reflection on the gospel in the light of our lived experience, how obsessed we are with security. And it's our obsession with security that is creating this domination in the world. It's creating our obsession with getting oil. It's creating the military-industrial complex. And if we could create a theology of insecurity, we would know we are fragile creatures and we're in this together on this very small blue planet. And so that reality, I think, could break open. So it's the same praxis. But the content, because we don't have the same experience of oppression. I, I mean, okay, I was, a, I was a rabid feminist for a while. When I first got in touch with the fact as a woman, I was oppressed. Just said, so, God, I'm not saying it was right. Uh, yeah, yeah, but he was about 30 years off. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I do know what a rabid feminist is, but I'm not one now. But um, so, I mean, we do have some experience of oppression, and certainly racism is a, and sexism and all the isms our oppression, but it's not in the same economic grinding way of um, other nations. And so I think we have to be clear and claim our struggle and uh, do it. If you want to read a good book, a great book that sets out all of these different uh, uh, theologies is Elizabeth Johnson's book, uh, Quest for the Living God, which she also got in trouble for writing. It was fabulous. It, it shot it up to the top of the theology book charts and uh, so uh, support my friend Beth and get her book because it, it really is at the intersection of faith and life. It's wonderful. Um, right there in the middle, can you uh, get a microphone across? And, and then I see yeah. somebody down here too. Okay. I have a question, a couple of questions. I appreciate um, that you're going to Washington, D.C. and that you're working on these issues. And I'm very much aware of that the Vatican is worth $500 billion. So what do you think of the fact that the Vatican is sitting on $500 billion that could be distributed to the poor? Number one. Number two, what do you think of the mega churches in this country that pay no taxes? Number three, I heard a woman last night who speak, who uh, started this thing on 34 million friends, a dollar for every woman um, that's being victimized. And, and so their guess estimate is that in 35 years, the population will be 10 billion on the planet, of which everything else is thrown out because they're all the problems, lack of water, lack of food, everything. I mean... It, it's not going to matter a lot in Washington what goes on. So I wanted to ask you, where, where do you stand on family planning and the Catholic Church? And any of those issues you right, like well, to speak to okay, well, and pay taxes. Okay, well, that's Thank quite you. a handful. Okay, that, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure I can track all of those. Well, let's start with the, with the $500 billion in yeah. the bank. Oh, in the Vatican. Okay. Um, Pope Frank is doing... Uh, a stellar job that has a lot of uh, people nervous for his safety because he right. is stirring up that hornet's nest and getting accountability and transparency which has not existed. You know, it's 500 years since the Vatican was reformed, so my people are not noted for quick change. <laughs> but um, the, the fact of transparency is uh, key, and the fact that they've been a great source for money laundering, it appears, seems to be problematic. And um, he really is grappling with that. Uh, the fact that there's all that um, expensive art um, in the Vatican, in a way it goes, Jesus, uh, there's this piece in the Gospel which, which is a little disconcerting, where you just sell it and give to the poor where the apostles are griping at Jesus. that uh, They think it's Mary Magdalene, but it, it's a Mary, comes and has this really expensive oil, this nard, and she breaks the bottle over Jesus' feet and anoints his feet and does all this, you know, really extravagant drama. And the apostles are all upset. You know, we could have taken it and sold it and give, gave it to the poor. And Jesus says, eh. No, not always. You know, you don't have me with you for very long, so you might want to enjoy it a little bit. Um, so I'm not sure that just selling it to the poor 
makes sense, but what do we, how do we use beauty for all? How does all, how do we all participate in beauty? And sometimes it's important to protect beauty because it can get privatized and hidden. I mean, one of the glorious things about art museums is that beauty is available and beauty is essential if we want to create values and community. We've got to have beauty. It's okay, I got it, I got it. And then, and then the next one is uh, okay. mega churches and, and tax exemptions. Oh, tax exemptions. Oh, yeah, I, I do this whole workshop on how it's not the worst thing to pay taxes. And, so, and I pay taxes, so for me, paying taxes is my way to be able to claim your part in our society. So uh, the thing is, out west, we have much smaller uh, tax-free zones than in the East. In the East, it's pretty shocking to me, the amount of, uh, in Pennsylvania, religious organizations can get exempt from sales taxes. I mean, that was shocking to me. Uh, so I'm more than willing to go with you. Yeah, tax them, that's fine. We need them. Uh, but, but the real reason is, is because we all should contribute to the future of our society. Now, the theory of tax, there are two theories of tax exemption for churches. One is separation of church and state. Because uh, we know what caused the revolution was heavy taxation that was controlling uh, people in ways that uh, just was grinding them down. And so we said with the First Amendment that uh, the government could not tax churches because you could grind down a church and therefore control the exercise of faith. And if we're going to have free exercise of faith, then you can't have taxing of churches. That's one theory. And the second for the nonprofits that get uh, exemptions is that they're doing services that the government would have to do if they didn't exist. And so it's like the idea is that the people can support nonprofits and good work gets done and it frees up government to not have to do it. So I, I think probably the first the the Supreme Court's all about money and and speech and all this other stuff. So I have a hunch that they won't say that churches can be taxed, but it's possible. And the third is is the upper population of the the globe can't sustain more than ten mil, ten billion people. And uh, what's your position on birth control? <laughs> I took a vow of celibacy, so I took care of that for me. <laughs> I mean, really, it's serious. I mean, be serious. Ask the nun a, a birth control question. I mean, um, it is worrisome. We have to put our heads together. Uh, but the other thing that we do know is that there are many ways of caring for each other. And one of the huge problems is that the U.S. sucks up too much of the resources and that there's enough to go around if we share. And um, that the long-term prognosis, yeah, it's concerning. Actually, global warning, warming is really concerning because we're going to lose a bunch of our land mass, and then what's going to happen, and the disequilibrium. And I mean, there's all kinds of problems. But uh, birth control seems, but women have worked out pretty well how to take care of that. So I vote with women. <laughs> The gentleman up here on the left in the blue shirt. Yes, um, not to uh, confine ourselves to immigration, but still, uh, in the last week, two weeks, a month, there's been an enormous flood of mostly unaccompanied children from Central America uh, and one can only imagine how many of them did not make it through Mexico, but there were casualties along the way. And it, it, it looks like this is an unprecedented amount. And I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not sure that welcoming every person in need in the entire planet to, to America and to make them into consumers is really going to be a solution for us or for them uh, or for the planet. Right, right. I, I think you raise a really important point, which is one of the things we also work on, which is push factors for immigration. This actually, this issue of unaccompanied minors, uh, immigrants, 
has been building for about the last year, and it's a direct relationship to some uh, to two things. One is our trade policy, and the second is our war on drugs. And that those two policies together have created a uh, basically a combat zone with the drug cartels in uh, Central America, and that it is so dangerous that families are sending their kids here alone just because they're desperate to get them out and to keep them safe. So I agree that, and, and let me tell you, this the uh, Senate bill is not an open door policy at all. So don't worry, don't worry. Um, but the issue I think that's the tougher issue is what, how do we deal with push factors? The fact that it is U.S. policy that drives migration, and the fact that I, I say a big part of the the migration issue, the undocumented issue, is because of global television. We export television to the whole world. And when you combine hunger with a vision of an alternative, you put hunger and hope together, you're going to get movement of people. Uh, I, I was um, in, uh, on the bus last year, we were in uh, San Antonio, and Congressman Pete Gallego was speaking at our press conference. You have to know it was like, it was 2.30 in the afternoon in San Antonio in the summer. It was 111. And they brought out metal chairs to sit on. It was horrible. <laughs> but Pete Gallego gets up to uh, give a talk. And his son, his uh, um, eight-year-old son, uh, was there and hadn't seen his dad because Pete had come right from the airport to the event and his wife and son were there to pick him up. <laughs> and Nicholas sees his dad and his dad's going to give this talk. He walks up to the podium and Nicholas goes, Poppy! And runs up and throws his arms around his dad and, you know, everybody goes, oh, it was really sweet. And then Pete says, you know, I can't give my talk. I, I've got to tell you, when, when my attitude towards immigration changed, it was the first moment that I held my son, and I knew I would do anything to protect him. I would, I would give my life for this, for this kid. And I know I'm like every other parent in the world. I will care for my kid. And a couple, few days later, we were uh, south of Tucson at the Pascoyaki Reservation, and I was talking to the chairman of the Pascoyaki. And it, it, that's a whole other thing, is the, the impact on indigenous peoples. But the he told me that he himself had found the body of a woman curled up under a bush on the reservation. And when they rolled her body over, she was holding the body of her small child. And I realized that that woman had the same desire as Pete Gallego. One happens to be in Congress. The other happened to be in an intolerable situation where she risked everything and lost. And so uh, we have got to be real about what's going on. If we export hope through television, we cannot act surprised when people come here. At uh, um, North Carolina, we held a, uh, um, a business roundtable. And the guy from the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce, we were in Charlotte, and the guy from the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce said, well, you know, you never hear about the Russian dream or the French dream or the Argentinian dream. You hear about the American dream. I think we ought to have truth in advertising, don't you? And I thought, whoa, yeah, we should, we should. But the, the, the war on drugs element in this is yeah. profound because oh, uh, Guatemala is a narco state. Uh, Parts uh, of Mexico. And uh, El Salvador is taken over by gangs, MS-13, right. and gangs deal drugs. That's their principal occupation. Uh, Honduras is taken over by a drug cartel uh, as well, or by series. And the, the cartels are getting it both ways. They are, are destabilizing these countries, making them so violent that parents are, are sending their kids up. At the same time, they are in the coyote business. So they get it both ways. But at the end of the day, the responsibility the American people have is that we are the market for drugs. Well, and we're the market for drugs, and we've also been funding the anti-drug activity without creating any real economy. Do you know what happened in Salvador? In Salvador, they, you know, the, there was the war, and then in the 90s they made peace, and to support peace, then um, the Clintons gave some economic incentive money to corporations to go down there. So uh, so our corporations set up in Salvador to create employment opportunities. Great idea, really nice, think it's really good. Then the Salvadorans start saying, hey, but you're paying really awful wages. 
So I, for reasons I don't understand, they passed a law that created minimum wage for Salvadorans. But then the corporations figured out it didn't say Hondurans or Guatemalans. So what did they do? They fired the Salvadorans, imported Hondurans and Guatemalans, and forced educated, capable Salvadorans out of employment. And so what happens? They move north. So it's, it's been a history of economic instability. And then we arm the military to help fight drugs. And you're right, we create the markets. But it's also we're creating the violence. It, it's this inequality. I mean, the Pope's right. Inequality is the source of all this evil. We've got, it's the only way we're going to stop violence is to change it so that we all participate in a moderate way in an economy where people can live in dignity. Gentleman here in the front. Uh, I recently heard on NPR there was a certain European Catholic cardinal that entertained the possibility of a Catholic policy to permit priests to marry. Can you cardinal confirm Casper. and elaborate on this report? Yeah, Cardinal Casper. He, he's like this uh, mavericky cardinal. It's really cool. He is also considered to be the Pope's theologian. And so it's thought that, uh, it, and it was a dueling thing. There's so much high politics going on in the Vatican. And, and I do D.C. politics, but man, Vatican politics is <laughs> even worse. So um, there's Cardinal Mueller. Cardinal Mueller uh, did this, uh, a statement that he made to the women religious who visited him uh, it's about six weeks ago now. And uh, it was really hostile, which quoted, what's her name, in... No, 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 not, oh, she's a contemporary who's very critical of nuns in the United States. She's a very conservative, right-wing person. And, cult and culture. And so, um, so she has all these statements. So Cardinal Mueller practically quoted some of her stuff. And, and a friend of mine who actually worked with, on the book with me, uh, David Gibson, tracked it down. So it was kind of cool. And uh, so then, a day later, Cardinal Casper's here in the U.S., and he's talking. So he starts talking about, oh, well, you know, there's no theological reason we can't have married clergy. We did until the 1100s. So um, there's, so it looks like it's kind of dueling sound bites between the two of them. And uh, Casper's more related to the Pope Pope really doesn't like Mueller, but didn't want to deal with the fight of moving him out of the Congregation for Doctrine of the Faith. So it's politics. It's all politics. It's kind of fun. But. And, and Mueller's a German, is he? Yes, yes, Mueller's a German. Now, you so actually, Casper's a German, too, right. but I don't make fun of his name. <laughs> well, <laughs> but you, you were saying earlier in your, at the podium that the Americans provide a lot of money. Absolutely. My understanding is that the Germans provide an awful lot of money to the Vatican because under German law, there's a religious tax. Right. So they have enormous revenue flow, and that explains the influence of Ratzinger and uh, others. Is that... Well, that, that, is, that is a piece of it, but historically, the U.S. church has provided even more. Proportionately, I think they... Right. But the, the, see, the German church does have a subsidy because most of the Catholic churches, one, are historical monuments, so the uh, government takes care of them, that they fund uh, the staff of all churches, so it's the idea of support, trying to get over the Reformation or Martin Luther or something, that they support them all. And um, mm -hmm. so it's um, created a really interesting reality so that the people, but, but one of the things that's happening is that the people in Germany are not as participative in religion because it is totally funded by the government and they don't need to be as engaged. So the leadership is not uh, at all responsive. Here in the United States, I think our bishops, our middle management, we have a middle management problem, as are beginning to wake up to the fact that hmm, there, there's not a lot of support coming in. And so I think there's some changes happening. But it's not been happening in uh, Germany. 
-hmm. Though they have a much uh, shrinking pool of ordained or Catholic sisters, it's way smaller even than the United States. It's the lady here in the third row. It, it, it'll come here. Thank you. I had a question, but I have a statement first. My great, 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 great grandfather was in the British Crown Colony of Pennsylvania, and he did not want to pay taxes. And he joined the minority of people who said, we want a new government. And when that new government came about, they said, you know what? We need money, exactly. and we have to tax you, but we have no way to enforce it. And we have something called the effective supply tax, and Washington's men need shoes, they need food, so we ask that you please contribute a tax. And I have photocopies of pages where my great-great-great-great-grandfather's name and the names of other people How are cool. who voluntarily contributed money to a tax. And that's how our government, our country, is founded. Okay. So, and my quick question is, I have Catholic friends, I'm not Catholic, and they say there's no way to reconcile a woman's right to choose with the Vatican. And so oh. I want to ask you, what may I say to those people? Um, read my book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, here's the deal. Um, my, the, the, the beloved church has... Went, went a little nuts. It's, it's so much easier for old celibate men to tell women what to do. And it makes it really nice because it's all about them and it's not a, I mean, you know, about out there. It's not having to deal with your own conversion or your own wrestling. So in my book, there's three things that are controversial in my book, I think. Uh, but you can always be surprised. One is what I do say about abortion and the right to choose is that I mean, I'm totally in support of life, so I'm pro-life. I mean, Margaret, for me, Margaret dying without health care is a life issue, and, and it is, and so many people in my beloved church have just become pro-birth as opposed to pro-life. And so trying to deal with the dignity of all of life. Um, I, when I practiced, I, I practiced family law for 18 years up in Oakland and started a low-cost legal service center. And one of the young people that I was appointed by the court to represent was a 13-year-old who had been raped by her uncle and was pregnant. And um, uh, that shaped me dramatically when Jamie was wrestling with the issue of what, what do you do, a 13-year-old? And um, she was considering an abortion, and I would have supported her in it. Luckily, praise God literally, um, she had a spontaneous miscarriage, and though she was seriously traumatized. But it taught me that I can never stand in the shoes of another woman making a tough choice, and that I am old enough to have known the horrible stories of what happened to women, desperate women, who went to back alley and ended up either dead or horrible infections. So I cannot righteously say that we should outlaw abortion. I can't. I'm not in favor of it. I don't know anybody that thinks it's a great idea. But, um, but I think that the response is, how do we support women in carrying babies to term? How do we, and all the evidence shows is that the abortion rates goes up when the economics are bad. And um, over the last eight years, the abortion rate has actually gone down for all of the economic quintiles except for the poorest, the poorest of the 20 per, the poorest 20 percent. And so I think what we do is let's support women. So what I say is I'm pro-life and pro-choice. It is quite com quite consistent, quite quite in keeping with our church's teaching. And what's also interesting is the French bishops figured that out. The French bishops have a pro-life, pro-choice stance, so it's doable. It's just our guys got a little hijacked. You're Gentleman right. here in the second row. Uh, Where'd the mic go? You can come around the front if you want to. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the other way of doing it. Sister, I was encouraged to hear you just a few minutes ago in your mind pause at a place where you said that there was possible approach of faith uh, in the family uh, to create a dialogue that might look at the belief system as a place 
to say we've cramped around this mountain long enough that we can turn north here. You spoke of pro-life. Uh, you may recall me. I mentioned the fact that Pope Paul VI had an encyclical on, right. on life. And I was curious in terms of uh, His Holiness's uh, liberation theology, if it tied in at all with uh, Pope Paul VI ecumenical outreach. Hmm. Interesting. And if that could be a platform. And in closing, could you suggest to us how we might have access to some literature that would give us access to uh, His Holy Holiness's thinking? And if that's skipping over uh, Ratzinger <laughs> to Paul VI, if that we could see a picture there. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, good point, good point. I, I think on the ecumenical front, um, what uh, Pope Francis did when he was in the Middle East was pretty bold, inviting the, uh, you know, Perez and Abbas to come together in prayer. The fact that he met with the patriarch, the fact that he's about healing and bringing people together, I, I find that really hopeful, and it's my experience, it's what I think the gospel's about, is that Jesus is always about reaching out, and that there's room for everyone at the table, and that there's no litmus test to, to be at the table. And in this glorious document, if you haven't read the exhortation, rarely are Roman documents readable. This is fabulous. I love it. Anyway, but he says that the church should not be a toll keeper where you parcel out sacraments only to the most deserving. Rather, it's food for us on the journey. It's open to all, which is, which is lovely uh, and, and ho so hopeful. Uh, where can you find out more? My, my beloved organization, Network, and thank you for asking me this, networklobby.org, we're doing this whole year, is uh, themed around this, uh, this exhortation called Joy of the Gospel. And what we're trying to do is to lift up the economic analysis as well as the uh, challenge of faith to be open to all. And one of the things that I realize is uh, I get judgmental when I'm insecure. And when I'm feeling nervous myself, then I'd rather blame you, you know, because if, if, you know, you're obviously wrong. So I'm obviously right. So I feel better. But um, what I think Pope Francis is really challenging us to is to have holy faith and holy doubt, and that it's the two together that really makes us the possibility of being community, because then I need you, and you may need me, so that we can make something uh, more whole happen. So on our website, uh, networklobby.org, we've got a whole, we've got a study guide for this thing, we've got... Uh, <coughs> A bunch of our analysis is being done in terms of what the Pope is saying. Because uh, he keeps saying stuff, which is fabulous. It's hard to keep up with him. And he's <laughs> tweeting, too. So uh, follow him on Twitter, but follow me, too. Um, but um, there, there is a lot of opportunity here, I think. And the fact, his, his statement on the plane coming back from Brazil, who am I to judge, I think was... I had a friend who said, but you're the Pope. <laughs> I mean, that's your job. But he, so he's really setting it in a whole new way. And I, I, I take a lot of hope at that. By the way, there's some um, flyers that, that Sister Simone bought uh, up in the lobby. Just as we close, I want Simone to read a poem from her new book, A Non on the Bus, how all of us can create hope, change, and community. In this particular poem, I think it's very appropriate to the news of the moment. Oh, yes, yes. Um, just to set a scene, I, I was in Baghdad in, in 2002 before the invasion, and our last night in Baghdad, we were just on a fact-finding mission. It was December, and um, uh, we were on a fact-finding mission, and the last night we went to an Italian restaurant. Uh, 
and uh, because we knew it had a generator, so we were going to actually get hot food. And uh, when we came back, there was a, a wedding party taking place in the light coming from the plate glass window of our hotel. And the, uh, the people drew us in to dance. There were 11 of us. They drew us in to dance. And this guy dancing next to me, I'm a poet, not a dancer. And this guy dancing next to me said, leaned over and said, how long do my niece and her new husband have to live in peace? How long until you start bombing us? I was like, whoa, whoa. Well, this is the poem that was given that night. Uh, 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 Barbara Kingsolver says that poets can't claim to be a poet. Poems are given, and you just have to pay attention to them. Otherwise, they're like dust bunnies that roll up under the couch and get lost. But this one was given, and I paid attention. And it's called Incarnation. Let gratitude be the beat of our heart, pounding Baghdad rhythms, circulating memories, meaning of the journey. Let resolve flow in our veins, fueled by Basra's destitution, risking reflective action in a 15-second world. Let compassion be our hands, reaching to be with each other, all others, to touch, hold, heal this fractured world. Let wisdom be our feet, bringing us to the crying need, to friends, or foe to share this body's blood. Let love be our eyes, that we might see the beauty, see the dream, lurking in the shadows of despair and dread. And let community be our body warmth, radiating Arab energy to welcome in the foreign stranger, even the ones who wage this war. And let us remember on drear distant days, we, are a promised Christmas joy. We live as one this fragile, gifted life, for we are the body of God. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us.